If you're a flat earther and you're serious about making a documentary that you think refutes an entire continent, then you should damn well make sure the documentary in question is correct. Unfortunately, in the case of Space Busters documentary Scantarctica, they have not done that. In fact, they couldn't be more wrong. Hello all and welcome along to another video with me, Simon Dan. Thanks very much for joining me. Right, this is episode 9 of debunking the Flat Earth documentary Scantarctica. If you haven't seen the previous 8 videos yet, they're all linked in the description. Go and watch them first, or alternatively, wait for the supercut to be released where all the videos will be linked together. This time, for today's episode, the Space Busters team focus on the sun itself. Away we go. Many people have pointed out the sun often turned into a squished oval American football shape in the 24-hour sun time-lapse footage they took in Antarctica. Obviously, that can't happen to a giant Jesuit space fireball 93 million miles away, so they are stuck trying to physically explain it away as some kind of camera distortion or digital rendering problem because their brains can't think metaphysically that it may be distortions in the apparent sun wave, since the source sun above is moving. Actually, it was explained perfectly by Dave McKeegan, who took the footage. He explained the footage was taken with a 360 degree camera, which is 280 degree lenses stitched together. The warping of the sun is when it passes between the stitching of those two 180 degree lenses. So no issue with the sun itself, just the camera used. It is even more distorted and obvious on the video footage on the left that suddenly appeared out of nowhere, claiming to be taken by someone a few years earlier, but for some reason nobody could find until now. When you put it in negative, it's very obvious. The same phenomenon is happening. This footage is from Anthony Powell and was available when it came out in 2015. The sun appears distorted in this one when it's low to the horizon. Because of atmospheric refraction, the light bends through layers of air, especially in freezing places like Antarctica, where temperature inversions bend the light. It's real footage taken in a real atmosphere on a spinning Earth. And because neither of their Jesuit Newtonian materialism models can account for a giant space fireball suddenly squishing into a blob two or two and a half times wider than it normally is, they have no choice but to fall back into either or logical fallacy thinking. It's either the camera digital rendering doing that, or it's some kind of atmospheric mirage, even though clearly neither of those happen when people film the 24-hour summer sun in the north of Sweden, Finland, Lapland, even though the atmosphere has more humidity there to distort vision. First of all, it does happen. Photographs of the mid-light sun in places like Norway or Sweden often show things like flattened suns and sun pillars, plus shimmering effects and lens flares. The Antarctic air is often colder, creating stronger temperature gradients near the surface. These cause stronger refractive bending than the more humid but thermally stable air in Scandinavia. Humidity isn't the main issue. Temperature inversion and angle of observation are. It must seem like magic to them, so they just don't address this obvious problem. Do you see a giant squishy blob in the northern summer 24-hour sun? This fallacious thinking also stops their brain from asking the obvious next logical question. If that really is a giant magic space fireball on either model, how is it that the Lapland cities like Longyear Buton on Norway's Svalbard Island and the rest are all having their hottest and most humid months of the year during their months of 24-hour summer sun from June 21st through mid-August up to 10 degrees Celsius, which is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, even though it's below freezing or just above the rest of the year. If the sun is up 24 hours a day, every day, for several months, the ground has more time to absorb heat. It accumulates warmth. Permafrost melts. Wildlife migrates. It's called summer. If he goes where I think he's about to go, this is not going to end well for him. And pay attention. They're allegedly on 78.13 degrees northern latitude. Yet Jaron and crew are standing down in Union Glacier in December under their alleged 24-hour summer sun on the exact same alleged latitude ring as Kunlun Station 
80.2 degrees south latitude, so nearly identical to their northern Longyear Buton Svalbard counterpart, Union Glacier and Kunlun, allegedly already having a 24 hour sun since a month earlier on November 21st. Yet, after a month of 24 hour sun, it's not 10 degrees Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit on Union Glacier like it is in their northern Longyear Buton's twin counterpart in their summer. Jaren and crew are freezing their asses off in minus 4 to minus 6 Celsius or 21 to 24 degrees Fahrenheit, well below freezing. Yep, he went there. Just because two locations share a similar latitude at opposite sides of the planet doesn't mean they'll have the same temperature. Svalbard is near sea level and sits in the path of warm Atlantic currents, especially the Gulf Stream. Union Glacier in Antarctica, that's 2,000 meters above sea level. It's on an ice sheet that reflects sunlight in the middle of the coldest, driest, windiest continent on Earth. And yes, it does stay cold in Antarctica, even under the 24 hour sun. But not because the sun is fake, but because the ground is ice, the elevation is high, and it's surrounded by the coldest ocean on the planet. The Globe model says, yeah, there's Svalbard at 78 degrees northern latitude, and there's Union Glacier at nearly identical 80 degrees south latitude. And since Svalbard is allegedly tilted towards the sun in its summer, that's why it is having 10 degrees Celsius, 50 degree Fahrenheit weather and a 24 hour sun instead of below freezing like usual. And also why it is having 76% humidity as evaporating water and ice from heat causes humidity. Okay, great. That's fine. Please don't now go and repeat your argument then. Paradoxically, when its latitude twin Union Glacier allegedly faces the exact same alleged space fireball for its summer and alleged months of 24 hour sun, that fireball doesn't heat them up at all. It keeps them well below freezing and magically never melts any ice or snow. While the North gets 76% humidity, when the retards were all screaming about vape gate, as Jaron rightly explained, you can't see your breath in Antarctica because there is 0.0023% humidity, not 76%. Yep, he has. Brilliant. That's not a paradox, it's climate science. Let's clear this up. The sun shines on both poles during their respective summers. That's a fact, but what matters is how the air and ground responds. In the Arctic, you've got ocean water and rock and darker land surfaces that absorbs and holds onto heat. In Antarctica, you've got an icy plateau, 2000 meters high, covered in snow that reflects most sunlight, in air that's dry and cold and thin enough to let heat escape. Humidity, of course it's higher in the Arctic summer. There's melting going on. In Antarctica, nothing melts. That's why it's still a continent of ice and not a water park. I hope that clears things up. Please don't repeat it again. One would think any rational person would put this all together and start to question if they are seeing a metaphysical electromagnetic light phenomenon or even fake technology, since either way, it defies all attributes of a physical space fireball. But apparently not. No, it doesn't. And no, no one's questioning that. I don't think the sun is a metaphysical electromagnetic light phenomenon. All that it's fake by technology. Just you and your friend and a sprinkling of flat earthers. I need to tie this all together so we can get to these two smoking guns, Rothera and San Martin, which absolutely debunk Jaren's fallacies and false claims. Really? Because your smoking guns have not been that smoking so far. Remember, Jaren has made the claims, not me. So I don't have to prove anything, I just have to disprove his. His first claim that the Earth must be a globe because it's the only way this globe software can so accurately predict sunrise, sunset times, day lengths, etc. has already been destroyed and will be slam dunk flushed down the toilet shortly with even more undeniable proof. I hardly doubt that, but go on. His second claim is that seeing a 24-hour sun in Antarctica can only happen on a globe, which Dave Weiss and Marty Leeds have shown can be faked. No, they haven't. I mean, I don't even say that lightly. They have no clue what they're talking about. They guessed and undenied their way through a video. That's all. So that alone destroys Jaren's claim. Whether that sun was faked or not, it is a real possibility. 
that must be explored and debunked before Jaron's claim has any validity. And I will show you that a 24-hour sun is absolutely possible in certain areas on a flat plane of inertia inside a metaphysical toroidal field at certain times of the year, which also destroys Jaron's baseless claim that it can only happen on a globe. You haven't shown that at all. You said that and then provided no evidence to support it. More guesswork and hopefulness, I think. Whether what I propose is actually happening or not, it is a real possibility which must be further researched and disproven before it can be taken off the table and any validity given to Jaron's second baseless claim. No, it doesn't work that way round, I'm afraid. You need to make the prediction and then experimentally prove it. Otherwise, I can make up a model that says Flurf Tears power the sun and then expect people to research it and disprove it before we can say it's not so. Nonsensical stuff. So an airplane drops six or so people off here and they see and film what looks like a 24-hour circling summer sun that magically doesn't melt ice or snow or cause humidity like its northern counterpart, and they have no clue if here is here or if here is really here. Well, they do. They were independently tracked with GPS, and Critical Think even filmed the flight. Just like channel apparent but not real source Kardashians will never turn up anywhere in this dish except this sweet spot right here, the apparent circling sun source wave frequencies will never appear anywhere else off the toroidal field than here, not here and not further out here. So if Union Glacier is really here, they could see the apparent sun circling around them overhead because its source frequency transmitter or real sun is circling overhead and the waves are focusing now off of a three-dimensional toroidal donut dish, not a little partial one-sided dish off your roof like the Kardashians with a non-circling transmitter tower. Total nonsense and totally unproven. All of that. You expect people to just believe you. Of course you do, you're a flat earther. But even these are just oversimplified two-dimensional cross-representations of wave behavior. A toroidal field is three-dimensional, so Union Glacier here could be seen rather like this. Think of them being dropped off here, or there, or there. Because since the toroidal field is an enclosed 360-degree parabolic donut-shaped TV dish, and the transmitting source frequency is circling inside the dish, not a stationary tower far away, the same exact wave signal could possibly appear anywhere and everywhere in that sweet spot around the dish simultaneously at the exact same time and sweet spot location all around an ice wall. I'm so sorry, I zoned out then. Did you say anything important or different? Did they, guys? Yeah, thought not. No different than everyone in every bathroom around the Rock Stadium still getting to hear the apparent end of the guitar amp wave frequency, but not the actual guitar amp source frequency itself at the exact same time. Just because the amp isn't in the bathroom next to you doesn't mean you can't experience it. What are you talking about? I'm sorry, but my patience has been tested enough for this episode. Coming up with rubbish like this and just expecting people to believe it. Unreal, it really is. Well, there we go. Another episode of Debunking Scamtartica all wrapped up. We have three episodes left to go. Let me know in the comments what you thought of that one. As I say, we're all done and dusted for another one. Thanks so much for watching today. It is, as ever, appreciated. If you enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the thumbs up button too. I've been Simon Dan, have yourselves a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow where I'm taking someone who's trying to debunk Mini Minuteman. See you then. <laughs>